And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, a man who is a man who has had decades worth of experience as a voice actor, an ADR director, and a script writer working uh, working with three different companies over the years, and the co-founder of Anime Dallas. He is he is a man of many voices. He is commonly known to some as the Anime Dad, but to us laymen, he is Swayze. John Swayze. How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right, man, for an old dad, I guess. <laughs> so, I'd, I'd like to... I often start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. and I, asked, I asked this kind of thing with, with when I had Spike on the first time, but I'd like you to walk me through when you first got pitched this whole anime thing and what your earlier reactions were. So, yeah, that's that's an easy one, Mildred. That's a, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was an actor in Houston, mm -hmm. Texas, making a living, doing very well, doing voiceover, doing film commercials. Um, I'd really built up quite a reputation um, as a, as a Houston actor and it was, you know, making a living. I mean, I was doing quite well. I had several national voiceover accounts and had done a couple of uh, feature films and like Dazed and Confused and Ray and uh, a couple of TV movies and such. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was in a band called the PC Cowboys. The PC Cowboys was a politically correct country and Western band. And it was really sort of a comedy act. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we were doing a comedy show in... Uh, Texas City, Texas, which is just south of Houston on the way to Galveston. And uh, we were doing a comedy show, and our opening act was this guy named Jason, uh, Jason Lee. And Jason Lee and I were talking backstage before the show, and I said, yeah, I do a lot of voice work and stuff. And he goes, man, I do a lot of voice work too. And I was like, well, that's weird because it's not a very big community. I'm surprised our paths have never crossed. And he said, well, I actually only do anime. And uh, I was like, what's anime? And he goes, well, it's Japanese animation. You should try it. And I'm like, well, I don't speak Japanese. And he says, no, we, we dub it into English and, you know, they put it out and sell it. And I was like, oh. And then, you know, he started giving me examples, you know, like Robotech or Speed Racer or stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, Pokemon like, oh, okay, I kind of know what you're talking about. But it really, for the most part, had really eluded me as a child. I just, I guess, was as of that age that I just, I didn't watch that. You know, that mm -hmm. was not my cup of tea. It just didn't interest me. I love animation, always have. and uh, But I just wasn't aware of this thing called anime. Anyway, mm -hmm. I auditioned for this company here in Houston called ADV Films. Mm -hmm. And it was a horrible audition. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I, I just fell flat on my face. And I, I left and I, I, I thought, I sat in my car and I thought, you know what? I can do better than that. So I went back in and asked them, pleaded with them to please give me another chance, which they did. And uh, I, I did it again and it was went much, much better. And they hired me, and I was working in the studio the week following week on a show called Golden Boy, mm -hmm. which was my first show as as the role of the director. And um, uh, you know, then again, I didn't really think much of it. I thought it was kind of weird looking animation, but oh well, whatever. And for really the first couple of years, at least, it was just another job in my quiver of job arrows, you know. I mean, it was just, it was no different than me doing a commercial. I just didn't, I did it and I moved on down the road, you know, until the next one came along. And, uh, but slowly, uh, actually not slowly, it was actually kind of rapidly. Um, suddenly they started adding studios and now there was one studio, now there's two studios, now there's five studios. And um, then they started uh, having shifts of work where you would, 
come in as a director from nine to four or four to 10. And uh, so they were running their uh, dubbing studios from nine till nine in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And um, it was like a factory. And all of a sudden within like four years, um, ADV Films was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world when it came to dubbing anime. We were the number one producer and distributor of anime in North America in Houston, Texas. And I was like, what on earth is going on here? I mean, this is, that's the kind of thing that you think would happen in LA or, or New York, you know, but mm-hmm. not Houston. And then of course, Funimation started up in Dallas with Dragon Ball Z and they got that on TV and suddenly it's becoming a huge deal. People like Sean Schemmel and Christopher Sabat and, you know, other amazing talent are doing these shows and ADV had their big show, which was, uh, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but even then, it was still very niche, you know? It was still a very, you know, out of the hundreds of millions of people in the country, I mean, there might be a million, might be a million that actually watched anime. But it was wild because you could tell that the audience was growing. And they were so hungry for it. They were just eating up everything, you know? Um, So it didn't matter what you, you know, we put out. I mean, I I don't mean like in a bad way, but I mean, we just would put out stuff, put out stuff, put out stuff. And then, you know, the audiences would decide what they liked, what they didn't like. And, you know, then I started to realize that there's so many different genres to anime. You can't just lump it all into one, you know, bucket and go, this is anime. It's like, it's a huge, huge genre. Um, with subgenres all throughout it, you know, sub subgenres of subgenres. Yeah. And so, anyway, I started working for them. Started working. Then I started directing, and I uh, about that was this is all about 1997. Mm-hmm. So um, I started directing probably in about 2000, and uh, I was, uh, um, you know, on again, off again. I was a contractor for a while, long, long time. Um, I started working at Funimation and I got, you know, very lucky and fortunate to land a bunch of really iconic roles or what have turned into iconic roles, uh, for me, like, um, Hohenheim from Full Metal Alchemist and Mm -hmm. Gendo from, I got Gendo from, uh, Sentai or ADV, but Mm -hmm. when it, when it changed hands, I moved with it. Um, uh, you know, Soul Eater, uh, Lord Death from Soul Eater and, crocodile from one piece and you know mm-hmm. so i you mentioned earlier i'm called the anime dad I, I i do have a i do play a lot of dads play a lot of dads and a lot of bad people and sometimes they're the same person <laughs> so um you know but i i've just been very fortunate of course now i play all for one in my hero academia and uh yeah so it's just been a wild thing but i've i've see, i've been doing this for 25 years and i've uh you know seen i've been through the ups and downs i've been through the you know the oversaturation the piracy stages the you know the the kind of explosion uh of this newfound you know people really start to dig it and i think part of the reason people really start to dig it is because of the dubs you know for for many years there's been this controversy or you know contesting of dubs versus subs mm-hmm. you know and the the subtitle people will tell you well it's you got to watch it in its pure form and i'm like well if you really want to watch it in its pure form then you need to learn to speak japanese and just watch it in japanese and not read not even look at subtext i've always i've always found that whole I, whenever that dub versus sub argument would come up i was the i was the one i was the one guy in the room who would look at the people who say you got to watch it in dub in dubs for reasons and you got to watch it in subs for reasons said you guys are both idiots <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean it's never it's, th- because it's never that um it's never no. it's never that simple no and and you know it's like a wine i mm-hmm. mean it's what do you like you know yeah. i don't personally like to read a movie i like mm-hmm. to listen to it and, and watch it and you know when i have subtitles on i find myself just i'm so busy reading it i'm missing some of the visuals that are going on you know yeah. but anyway anyway so um i i just think that that's you know there's been recently i said recently in probably the last 10 years um 
an explosion of, uh, pardon me, not only content, but um, just uh, just this surge of new anime fans. Mm. And when you go to an anime show or a comic con, you're going to see a lot of the same people. You know, it used to be if you went to an anime show, you're going to see anime people. But now you're going to see Darth Vader. You're going to see Stormtroopers. You're going to see uh, characters from the MCU. You're going to see DC. You're going to see Batman. And, you know, and it's the same way going the other way. If you go to a Comic-Con, you're going to see, uh, you know, uh, characters from Dragon Ball and characters from Yu-Gi-Oh! And characters from all sorts of things. I mean, yeah. you know, it's really uh, amazing. And it's just those worlds are all starting to meld and join each other and roll over on each other. And, you know, the audiences are just getting bigger and bigger. So it's still, I mean, I still would say it's a niche, but it's a really, really big niche now, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's almost, I mean, the fact that Sony is buying up Crunchyroll and Funimation, you know, is they want to have a dominant hand in anime because they see anime 10 years from now, you know, mm -hmm. and they want to be the, the people with the purse strings, you know, the people that hold the reins. Okay. So, um, it's, it's just going to get bigger. I mean, I, we're not anywhere near this thing blowing over, you know, it's just going to go for years. Oh, Ro Rome wasn't built in a day as the East, as the saying goes. And right. Uh, right. It is interesting that you mentioned that. Cause I, um, I keep a close eye on the, um, on the on what's actually on what's actually selling when it comes to print through um through through stuff like Comicron and um spe specifically the uh, stuff through D through Diamond and what graphic novels are getting distributed or getting distributed and bought the most. Mm -hmm. The last time I looked at it, which was about which was about a month and a half ago, because it's always because the report's always one month late. Um, the t when it came to the top twenty graphic novels. About eighty percent of that was manga. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just you know, it's not something that, and you know, the other thing too about the manga, and you know, because anime is, I mean, you probably know this, but anime is really commercials for the manga. Yes. I and mean, that's for the most part, that's that's <laughs> a, you know, I I don't. It doesn't make me want to go buy manga. It is it is a va it is a vast simplification, yes, but that is that it, that is that is somewhat um, the case. Yeah, especially especially with especially with some labels more, more than others, and especially say um, Shueisha, which which is the company that owns um, Jump. Mm hmm. And well, okay. well, I was going to say, but 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 not not every anime comes from a manga either. So yeah. it's not that's not a you're right that's not a hard and fast rule but yeah there's um, there's been a growing amount in the last few years that have come out of um light novels of all things mm. well i just think that it's it's great because it's it's really this whole new source of uh and resource for film and television mm -hmm. you know is is anime and manga yeah um from my own from my own perspective, it's interesting that you bring up that um, that cross pollination when it comes to convention scenes, where yeah, there what early on there was that whole, there was this um, for lack of a better term segregation or even ghettoizing of di of different um, fan bases. You had you had you had conventions that were exclusively nothing but comics conventions that were exclusively nothing but SF and so on. And as time has gone on, that's ca the walls between those have kind of eroded. And mm -hmm. I, um, I do a lot of stuff with tabletop RPGs, um, stuff like D and D and the like. And I remember when there was that first major wave where ADV was really starting to make noise. And, um, I was, gra I was grabbing new, I was grabbing stuff like new type and anime insider every month. Mm -hmm. Because even back then I was a wannabe journalist, <laughs> and I I distinct I distinctly remember seeing seeing arguments about whether or not um whether or not you sh whether or not you should be drawing from anime 
when you, when playing stuff like um, Dungeons and Dragons, which for the longest time had drawn its inspirations from um, pu from pulp fantasy and cl and classical fantasy stuff stuff like Tolkien, obviously, but also stuff like um, um, Robert E. Howard, Fritz Lieber, Michael Moorcock, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the argument that I had, which um, put me on the fringe at the time, especially given how at that time anime RPGs were treated as this separate genre, not a medium, was the creators of the creators of the first generation of role playing games were creating based on the stuff that they that they grew up reading and watching and mm -hmm. what they created was a reflection of that with time you're going to have a whole lot of people whose first introduction to the to the idea of of fa of fantasy fiction is going to be stuff like harry potter is going to be stuff like if, to use a few examples when it comes to anime stuff like slayers stuff like um orphan and mm -hmm. the and they're going to be using that as their frame as their frame of reference and to kind of to kind of demonstrate my point i've been seeing more and more indie comics that have very clearly been taking inspiration from anime and manga mm. and in that in that same vein that's what that's why that whole cross pollination doesn't doesn't surprise me and I think you're and if I may make a Nostradamus style prediction, you're going to see more of you're going to see more of that in the coming years. Oh, I would not disagree with that at all. I mean, and I'm, I'm as well. I think I think another thing too, <laughs> if you really want to put it in a super simplified way, yeah. Um, you know, when I started doing conventions and well, when when I first started doing anime mm -hmm. uh, in '97. There might be one or two conventions a month somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now there there was still the anime expo and there was Colossal Con or you know a couple of couple of big ones, mm -hmm. but for the most part they were little, real tiny shows. You know, five hundred people, clubs, you know, stuff like that. And uh, in fact, I was just at a show up in Denver called NDK, mm -hmm. and they started as an anime club twenty five years ago. And, uh, but they were small back then, you know, now they're like 20,000 people, but they were small back then. Mm -hmm. And, but to see now what these shows have grown into whether, and not only are they of enormous size, a lot of them, but there's four and five a week as opposed to one or two a month. And, and that tells you right there that a, uh, there are a lot of people out there that, um, really want to, uh, that, that are in this world. And it's, it's kind of like the geeks over there and the nerds over here kind of went, why are we arguing about anything? We could both enjoy both of, you know, let's unite, you know, mm -hmm. let's, let's join forces. And, you know, now they're going to take over the world. So <laughs> it's uh, about time. I mean, you know, but it's just, uh, you know, to see the, the rise of populations of, these conventions and not only the number of conventions, but the amount of people attending. And I attribute it to a couple of things, but number one is um, I'm a, I'm a big deadhead. I love the grateful dead mm -hmm. and jam bands, stuff like that. Oh yeah. And, and you know, one of the things about going to a dead show is that um, everyone's there for the same reason. You know, they're all there to have a good time. They're all there to interact and and just they're there to show their love for the thing that's there the grateful mm -hmm. dead well when you go to an anime convention i think it's kind of the same way i mean everyone's there no one's there to hassle no one's there to give anybody a hard time they're there to love on each other and have a good time and share their love of the very thing that the person next to you loves which is anime and so you've got that well uh recently i think part of you know, when the, when the world sort of collided, there became this new explosion of popularity. And, mm -hmm. uh, part of that I think is also, uh, in great, um, if you, if you line up the, the, you know, connect the dots kind of thing, you're going to see it really came to, came to fruition. I think when streaming became available because, you know, it wasn't just, you had to buy it on VHS where you got three shows per tape and you had to buy, you know, there's 24 shows, so you had to buy 12 tapes at 20 bucks a piece, you know, and then it was DVD and then Blu-ray. And then 
once streaming became available and, or, and once it started becoming more regularly available on TV through Cartoon Network, uh, Adult Swim and mm-hmm. such, um, it just became way more accessible and people are suddenly like, oh my God, yeah, mm-hmm. this is for me, you know? And uh, it created this resurgence, again, much like The Grateful Dead had in 1987 when um, their album uh, In the Dark came out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they've been touring since 67 or 65 actually. And here they are 22 years later. And now there's this eruption of popularity and you go, now they're playing stadiums and, you know, the like, and here it is, you know, 25 years or not even that long, but probably, you know, 20 years, um, after really people, when I started this business and suddenly it's just exploding. I mean, it's just unreal to me. It's, it's, it's really mind boggling. Um, and now I just, I know I'm kind of dominating here the conversation, but it's also, uh, you know, it's led to, I mean, this is how, this is my full-time career now. You know, I'm not, I don't do film and television or I don't do, I mean, part of it is that there's really not much in Texas to do. Part of it is the pandemic. Part of it is a lot of things, but the main thing is, is, you know what, I'm so busy with, recording i work as a full-time director so i'm recording as an actor working as a director and going to conventions and i'll do two or three conventions a month i mean there's just no time you know to do anything else and i don't want to do anything else i'm really enjoying what i'm doing you know so anime um you know for me as a performer Mm -hmm. has completely dominated my uh focus now, as an as an aside, if I can make a be- if I can make a bad joke and get out of my system, I find it kind of amusing that your first role was director, and then years later you would become a director. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah, that's um, funny. Bit of bit of Foreshad- um, foreshadowing, they call it. I I'd I'd say it's a case of life imitating art. <laughs> yeah, all right, fair enough. But some something else something else I I kind of find um. In, I kind of find interesting with that with that whole early days to later days. Now, I will I will notice amusing that you bring up um you bring up Cartoon Network because on my Sunday podcast, the uh, Geek Watch, we um we ended up dis- we ended up discussing um the effect that t- the effect that Toonami had when it came to expanding a lot of people's horizons. Mm-hmm. Um, because because. If you look at the, if you look at the, if you look at say the early days, and I'm, and when I say early days, I'm talking the um, tape trading days, when you, when, when it was, when it was a case of, get of getting up, getting a, um, getting a secondhand VHS and hoping you got lucky. <laughs> right. <coughs> but. Well, you, you but, want to go even for? Oh, let me just interrupt you real quick, but, and, and maybe this is what you're talking about, but man, you know, back in the early early days, when they started shipping animation over to Asia you know and they didn't have digital capabilities where they could just ship it over phone lines or ISDN or whatever Mm -hmm. they were actually packing up video or or film and putting it in cans and boxes and then shipping it over and then shipping it back and forth and all that. And a lot of times those boxes would come back and there might be a couple of animes stuck in there. And, and the people over here are like, well, what's this? And they'd look at it and they'd watch it and they'd find somebody that spoke Japanese and they'd start to create a little script Bible. And then they would literally, you said tape sharing, they would share it with a friend of theirs in another city. And then they'd say, you take a look at this. What can you make of it? Mm-hmm. And it would go around the country you know, maybe to 10 people over the course of a year. And by the time it got back to you, now it had this thick, you know, Bible of here's the script and here's what we, here's how it goes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, I mean, subtitles, hell, you're having to read a script and watch the damn movie. So, you know, but that, but that's what it grew from. And that's what the people that started Anime Expo, that's what they were doing Mm -hmm. way back when, you know. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But, no, no okay, worries, I man. Did, I, but... I, um, I may have, I may have, I may have a lot of, I may have a few years of experience when it comes to being a podcaster, but I, do, but I do not style myself as a professional. I always, I always say, we're not, 
we're not professionals here. We're assholes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I I like in the Statler and Waldorf riffing kind of way is is how I put it. <laughs> right, right. Um, but speaking of conventions, I'd like I'd like to I'd like to pick your brain as to as to your as to your react as to your reactions when you when you when you got invite when you got invited to your first convention. Were you familiar with the idea if, of the idea of enthusiast conventions before that, or was this brand spanking new for you? So I was afraid to go to conventions for a long time because um, I was afraid because I didn't really watch my work, uh, and I was doing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I it kind of. It's like at one point it got away from me. It's like, I don't have time to even begin to catch up on what I've done. Ergo, I don't know what people are talking about when they're talking about a particular show or a particular character, you know, because we don't, it's not like a movie or a TV show where you're on it every day. And you, you know, you know every, all the ins and outs of what's going on and you can, you can relay that experience and you can, you know, talk about the whole thing because you know the whole storyline. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in dubbing anime, you know, we come in with, we, we get, you know, an hour to do 50 or 60 cues or a couple hours, you know, however long it takes, but you may not know the, everything that's going on. So unless you sit there and watch the whole show after it's done, you're not going to know what the show's about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, unless you, you know, again, or read the manga maybe, or, you, you know, did that kind of stuff. But um, it's, uh, so I was a very afraid, I was, I was very worried and, um, that I was going to get the, you know, the kind of Star Trek question, you know, when you fan goes, yeah, in episode 10, uh, <laughs> your character is asked a question about his feelings for blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you respond in a rather unique way. Mm -hmm. How how do you think it would have been if you, you know, why did you do that? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know. But then I realized, well, it's a very simple answer because that's what the script said to do. And I'm just a dumb actor and I do what the director and the script tell me to do. But then I started going to conventions. Mm -hmm. My first one was MetroCon in uh, Tampa, Florida. I know that one. <laughs> in fact, my, my my first one and my second one mm -hmm. were both MetroCon. And uh, you know, I I didn't know much about conventions, but I did find out um yeah, they don't really ask that question. What they want to know is how what's your favorite character, or how you got into voiceover, or you know, that kind of stuff, and how do I get into voiceover and whatever. So that's easy for me. Mm -hmm. to answer the, I can field questions like that, you know, but, uh, yeah, I was still, I was very nervous. I realized, man, this is kind of a party. It's a big party scene and which I'm all for. I love that. So, uh, yeah, I love doing conventions and I, I really loved, uh, kind of getting into them. And, um, but it's amazing how they've really changed. Uh, mm -hmm. well, not really, I don't want to make it sound like they've really changed. They've just changed in that, you know, they're so much bigger, um, but also more importantly, uh, I've gotten bigger. If mm -hmm. I can say that, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound egotistical about that. It's just I'm, I, my pedigree is is greater, and my, you know, um, my reputation is bigger and better than it was when I first started. I mean, I remember when I first started, I was sitting next to Monica Rial in an autograph session. And people were walking by getting her autograph and I was just sitting there right next to her. Nobody wanted my autograph. They just, she was like, well, you know, John's in this show too. Do you want his? And they're like, mm, no, that's okay. <laughs> They'd walk <laughs> off, you know, but now that's not the case. I mean, I, I'm, like I said, I'm very blessed and uh, I've been very uh, fortunate to land some villainous dads and whatnot that are, um, have made me a, the bigger name. I was. I, my wife says, if Todd Habercorn is the Brad Pitt of anime, John Swayze is the Kevin Bacon of anime. 
Does this mean yeah. that we're going to have to do six degrees of Swayze? Well, you probably could. I think you probably <laughs> could. I had somebody, Mike McFarland, who's a director and an actor up in Funimation in Dallas, pointed out years ago, he goes, you know that, he goes, I, I was working on a show with him. Uh, could have been Evangelion for all I know, but or um, Full Metal Alchemist. But mm -hmm. he goes, well, you know, John, that you're the most prolific male voice actor in North America. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, according to Anime News Network, when you go and it lists people, actors, and it says uh, most prolific cast, and it lists all the actors that have been cast in anime, number one is Monica Rial, number two is Lucy Christian, and number three is John Swayze. And uh, so I've, I've got the dubious distinction of being the most prolific male. Not the most prolific overall, that's Monica. And, and you know, unless she just quits, no one will ever exceed her. <laughs> She's kind um, of that. But uh, anyway, mm -hmm. so, um, but yeah, but then, you know, I started doing more conventions and got a little more comfortable and then, uh, you know, started really enjoying them. And I really do them. I enjoy them immensely now. I, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, since the middle the middle of june i've done 12 shows in 13 weeks and people and people call and people call me nuts for all the interviews i do <laughs> yeah it's been crazy well i mean you know and we've it's been hard for us to get together on our this little thing just because i've been so dead gum busy traveling and when i'm not you know when i'm home then i've got to do all the stuff that i couldn't do over the weekend and stuff you know so it's just been including the social things and, and whatever. So it's, it's been a challenge, but uh, like I said, I'm very blessed and very fortunate. Wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, with, with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, we've, we've joked, we've joked about it. We joked about it a handful, a handful of times, but give, given, given the whole um, anime dad thing that's, be, that's become a, that's become a running gag. Um, was was that was that something that just kind of ha just kind of ha happened by happened by a series of coincidences or was there was there a point in time where um whenever whenever casting would come up you would get earmarked for the dad role well i don't know so much if it's i got earmarked for the dad role um i mean certainly now you know just the way my voice is, but mm -hmm. early on, I'm, you know, I'm 56. I started doing this when I was, um, 31 and, um, my voice was different back then, mm -hmm. but I've always fancied myself to be somewhat of a chameleon with a pretty good range. And, uh, you know, I, I feel that I've, I've got that, but, um, I, I never set out to be like, I'm going to be the dad or the bad guy or whatever. I just kind of got put in that role mainly, you know, too, because, uh, you know, Chris Patton and Greg Ayers and Vic Mignogna and Todd Haberkorn and all those guys or Spike Spencer that have that real youthful sounding, you know, kid like voice, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't have that. And, uh, so th that's what they do. You know, but I go and do the bad guy or the dad or the older, you know, whoever, because mm -hmm. that's what I do. And, you know, people ask you, are, are you afraid you'll be typecast or whatever? I'm like, no, nope. As long as I'm cast, I don't care. I mean, what difference does it make? You know, um, so I'm yeah, I, I never really set out to do that. But now it's kind of my. My thing, I guess, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of what I do, but, uh, there's, uh, lots of other folks out there that can do it. I'm certainly not alone in that, you know, mm -hmm. boat, a lot of great talent out there that can do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And now one, now, um, something, something I am, something I'm curious about is the trans is the transition from 
one form of acting to another. Um, speci specifically in this case, the transition between on ca on camera or on, st or on stage kind of acting to full on voice acting. Um, mm -hmm. Were there any were there any um, anything any any um, habits that you had to, that you had to unlearn when it came to that transition from more traditional kinds of acting into voice acting? Um, no, I mean, there was a learning curve, you know, just with the ADR process, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was uh tricky. Um, but I, I got that fairly quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned things, you know, I didn't, I've learned things over the years. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't uh, like a, there wasn't a learning curve as far as the acting part. I, I, I did learn that, uh, and I, as a director, I still feel this to be true that uh, stage actors are generally better suited for this kind of work than film actors. And that's mainly because uh, stage actors will project. And, you know, there's a feeling when people are like, well, I'm in front of a microphone. I just need to talk at this level like this. And it's like, no, you need to talk at a normal level and we'll adjust the microphones, you know, but if you're going to sit there and I'm on a microphone. So all I have to do is, is use this voice. Like, well, unless the character calls for that, no. So, um, but you know, film has always been hard for me. Mm -hmm. I've always been too big, you know, I've always, I, I get a lot of, man, John, man, you're a really talented guy, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, for film, you got to just kind of tone it down, you know, bring it down. Because with film, moving your eyes could be huge. Mm -hmm. But on stage, of course, you have to move your whole body, <laughs> you know. And so, um, I don't know. I, 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 I seem to take into it pretty quickly and pretty easily um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the film stuff, which is, you know, hitting your mark, landing on your spot, finding your light, you know, reading, reading against somebody that is not the actual actor that you're playing against because it's a cutaway shot or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, the main thing is, is uh, the hardest thing for me is that, you know, the camera can totally pick up every nuance about you. And if you're not acting like you, if you're not relaxed and being yourself, man, it'll pick up on that in a heartbeat. And it just, it'll sound fake and phony. And uh, so you have a little more forgiveness when it comes to the uh, voice acting, I think. Uh, you still want to be real and, and, you know, authentic, but uh, it's not quite as, you don't get popped for little subtleties like you do on film. Mm -hmm. So, um Anyway, yeah, and <clears throat> it's it's interesting that you bring up th that whole that whole thing about um, film actors being better suited than, oh, sorry, fil film actors being less suited than state than stage actors. Because I remember um, I remember me I remember meeting um, Dave Matronga at um, Metrocon a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I asked him I asked him about some of, about some of his war stories with ADV because I, because that's the um, that was the studio that I kind of grew that I kind of grew up watching a lot of. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. um, he plays Orphan. Yeah, and um, you should have seen how he popped when I br when I brought that up for him to, for him to sign. He had the biggest gr he had the biggest grin I ever saw. <laughs> That's but fun. He um he had told he had he had told he had told me that in it, that in the early cuts he was still he was still doing vo he was still doing the role like he like he was on camera, and. Somebody kept yelling at him. You gotta, gotta amp it up, cartoon boy, and just kept calling him that. Yeah, well, I mean, you do. You know, you can't. You know, the the main thing about dubbing, um, unlike doing, you know, what traditional prelay where you're creating the characters, mm -hmm. you know, the Japanese actor has already created the role. So, uh, performance wise, I, I think it's very imperative for. Uh, a dubbing actor to listen and watch what the Japanese actor did and then just mimic it. I mean, you know, you know, I'm not saying copy it, but you know, if they're 
yelling a line, you should probably yell that line and not just go, well, I'm going to, I'm going to play it down here. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's not the way it was done originally. We're, and, and really at the end of the day, we're just putting it into another language. Now, that being said, I think there's a little bit of a difference of what we're doing with anime and just dubbing movies into foreign languages or into English, you know, foreign movies. I mean, it's like, that's all, you know, we do have a little more leeway in, in the anime. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you don't, you don't scream if a character is just going, huh? You know, it just, I don't care what you feel you'd like to do that. You got to honor what's already there, you know, because it's already been created. You can't change that. And, oh. um, no, go ahead. Sorry. Well, to kind to kind of, to kind of follow up on that, um, I'd I'd like to I'd like to ask a bit about accents. <laughs> okay. Um like when it com when it comes to when it came when it came to doing accents, did you have did you have to um give yourself some give yourself some kind of training? Um well, I took, you know, classes in college and I I worked with uh um vocalist lingu linguistic folks and mm -hmm. stuff like that throughout the years. Um you know, and there's I, the, some of the accents that like the one that comes to mind is Salvador from Borderlands 2. And they said they wanted a Russian something, <laughs> you know, but, he, you know, so I gave him a voice like down here and then I throw Russian into it. So it sounds more like this. And, uh, you know, I don't think anyone is you know, one thing. He's a make believe character. So I don't think they're going to go, well, that's not really Russian. You know, like, they're not going to call me on that, but, mm -hmm. you know, some shows will, I mean, especially if it's a British accent or something like that. Um, we just finished working on a show uh, called Vinland Saga. Oh, yes. Is, I'm, uh, I am very familiar with, with that. It's, you have no idea how happy it made me seeing, seeing that get animated after, after presenting that particular manga to everybody I know for over a <laughs> decade. Well, and not only is it animated, we've dubbed it into English. So you can, I, I don't think you can get the dub version on Amazon, which is unfortunate, but you can get it through High Dive um, on a DVD or a Blu-ray. But I mean, we were dealing with Danes, so Danish accent, mm -hmm. French accents, English accents, um, whale, Welsh, and so, you know, we had to really kind of watch ourselves and, and make sure, uh, you know, whatever we did, because also, you know, all the actors are American speaking actors. So mm -hmm. we didn't want to create a world where all right, nobody uses an American accent. I mean, it's just, you know, it's so funny. It's like, people the other day, we were talking about this, like, what language did Jesus speak? And it's like, well, everyone knows he's British, you know. Uh, he's theatrically trained. I mean, he was a Shakespearean wonder boy, you know. And it's like, uh, but accents are hard. And yet, generally speaking, you leave accents, especially nowadays, man, I guess, you know, with the whole POC and uh, all those movements of, you know, actors of color should play uh, characters of color and, you know, women should play women and men should play men. I get, you know, it's just all of that stuff. And, you know, I, well, I, I, I agree to a certain extent. I also think, you know, the problem is man, we're just actors, you know, we're portraying fictional characters. So uh, especially in voiceovers, like what difference does it make if a black guy wants to be white or play a white guy? I don't care. I mean, what, you know, if he's a good actor, he's a good actor. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. I mean, you know, now, uh, I mean, I'll give you a great example and it's a little off topic, but I mean, um, Mike Henry, uh, created Cleveland on family guy mm -hmm. and he stepped down as Cleveland because he was like, you know, it's a POC thing, you know, uh, African-American actors should play Cleveland. Well, you run into obviously multiple problems. Number one, who are you going to find that's going to sound like 
what Mike Henry did. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing is, is that, you know, Mike Henry um, just created this voice of this character. Uh, I, I know Mike, I've met him a long time ago. We used to be friends out in LA and um, you know, I, I don't want to say I know his um, motivations and, mm-hmm. and you know, his character development. That's, I don't. But I always thought it was interesting that he stepped down because I thought, you know, this, you're not, you're not going in there and being some, I mean, Cleveland could be any color. I don't, you know, it, 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 it's not a specifically had to be an African-American guy. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it was never portrayed in a way to me that was like offensive or, you know, like, dude, that you're totally misrepresenting. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm off base with that. I just never I don't, thought I don't that think, was the I don't case. Think you, I don't think you are. Um, of course, of course, from my from my own perspective, there's I'm thinking about this from the perspective of um, logistics. Um, since there's the old there's the old adage: children study tactics, men study logistics. Because if you, I'll I, maybe it's just, maybe it's just my perspective, but I always envision when there, when whenever there's a situation where a um, where a new vo- where a new voice actor has to step in f- to f- to um follow up on someone else's work, it ends mm-hmm. up being a bit of a scramble at first. That's just the feeling that I've gotten. Yeah, it is. It is. But I mean, okay, so okay, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I mean. In in this particular case, um, Hank Azaria stepped down as a poo mm-hmm. in The Simpsons. But Apu was a stereotypical, you know, what Western white people see as an Indian. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was a caricature. And so he said, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. If it's offensive to the Indian culture, then, you know, I'm not going to do that. Okay. That's that I, that I get. I mean, as many times as I laughed at, at Apu, that I understand. But Mike Henry in Cleveland to me seemed different because it wasn't any stereotypical, you know, type of character to me. It was just a guy. So, but anyway, I don't want, I, that's a rabbit hole. We don't need to go down. I'm not trying to start a political thunderstorm here, but I just, um, I don't even know what prompted that. What was the original question? <laughs> oh. The I think the the original thing the original thing was just on um, accents. Oh, accents! Right, 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 right. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because then you get into well, is it appropriate for non-Irish people to portray Irishmen? You know, I mean, so it's, uh, I mean, because the problem, and and this is a tricky thing about accents too. A lot of people have very bad accents. You know, like, <laughs> can you do can you do British? Well, of course I can do British accents. Listen to me. I'm talking with an English accent. You know, it's like, no, that's horrible. You know, and so it's, it, accents are tough, man. I mean, I'll be honest with you. They're tough. And you try to <clears throat> win at all possible. Mm-hmm. You leave the accents to the people that have that accent. Yeah. You know, so. Oh. And I I can def I can definitely vou- I can definitely vouch for that kind of toughness. I do remember um, I, I remember I remember seeing an interview that Hugh Laurie did um when House when House was still airing and how it was really really hard for him to nail down an American accent, um, especially and especially when you consider that um even even with a given language, it's not a there's not a one size fits all kind of accent. Somebody from right. like there's a there's like given where I come from, of course, there's the people. There's everybody. Th- everybody thinks that a lot of people in Minnesota talk like um, the Minnesotans in the movie Fargo. Which, to be fair, I do know people who talk like that. Um, you've got in, you've got you've got you've got some who have the more southern drawl, and even that even that there's variations on it. Um, I I get the feeling one of the, one of the one of the trickier th- one of the trickier things to kind of do with accents is. At least when it comes to anime, is how is how how do you make an English equivalent to say somebody who has a um 
a co a Kansai Ben kind of a kind of accent, or the accents that are that are in places well, outside you know, of Japan, like say Osaka. Right, right. So that's that's very interesting. So sometimes, um, uh, you know, we'll go get a translator, mm -hmm. and we'll say, okay, so tell me what's going on, and, and it'll be like, well, they're talking about something because this character happens to be from this part of Japan, where, wherever it might be. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and that is, it's more country, you know, more countryfied. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean we're going to go, okay, then we're going to make him talk like this. That's not what I'm saying, but we do like, sometimes it'll be like, well, no, but they do have to have a very refined diction, mm -hmm. you know, because this is the way they speak to each other. They don't, they don't, they're not lazy with their words, you know, they're not lazy with their syllables and such. And, uh, yeah, so we will do that. It's not so much, we're going to capture the accent of, uh, this region, but like, so, okay. So like this one kind of comes from like, you know, New York or the Boston area, mm -hmm. you know, that Northern Northeastern or Midwestern, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is kind of what they would sound like in Japan. Uh, but, you know, we, you, you try to make it subtle because in all honesty, unless it's something huge, I mean, it, you just, the, the average person isn't going to pick that up. Mm -hmm. You know, that, there's, that's going to be beyond their scope of, of uh, what they are worried about. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um. Now, with with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, now I'm, I'm, I know I know in some panels they you brought up the whole favorite character thing, but that's a little bit too um, for lack of a better term, easy f for for me, for me and the others here in the temple. But I'd like to I'd like to go the opposite and um, tell me a story. Tell me if you have a story of a character whose vo whose um, voice was more difficult than others to nail down what you wanted to, what you felt was you needed to do with it. Mm -hmm. Wait, say that one more time. Um, tell me, tell me about a character who's, who's, um, who was a bit more difficult to nail down the voice that you wanted to do with them. Um, Hmm. I don't know what, you know, when we're, when we're working on a voice, mm -hmm. um, there's several factors that go into it. Uh, number one is, um, uh, the, um, you, you look at the character. Okay. Then you listen to the character. And you get an idea and a sense of what they what that character is. It's tonality. It's it's vocal uh, characteristics, um, and you want to try to match that as best as possible. Going back to what you were, we were talking about before, with dads. You know, mm -hmm. you get a lot of dads. You know, a lot of times you get you know you're going to get called in for something because that fits into your vocal wheelhouse, and. Um, but the first thing you do is you like to listen to it and see what, see what's going on with it. Um, sometimes you come in with preconceived ideas, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to the acting. And if the director feels like, okay, you're nailing the acting part, uh, I can fix the voice. That's easy. Uh, when I auditioned for the role of Lord death in soul leader, I was doing a bunch of, uh, uh, other roles like crocodile and, and uh, you know, just a bunch of other big characters with big, and I say big characters, I mean with big voices. Mm -hmm. And here I am getting Lord Death. Well, I didn't know anything about the show, but I could, was like, well, I can only imagine. His name is Lord Death, so he probably sounds like this, you know. And so when I went into audition, I started to do that. And the director was like, no, 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 no. Listen to the, listen to what the Japanese actor did. And I, so I listened to it and I was like, oh, oh, he's way up here like this. I see. 
And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's much better. So I did it. I read for it. And I got the part. And then when I went into the studio, actually, to record for the first time, we recorded probably 20 or 30 minutes in, into the session. And the director stopped and he said, hey, man, listen, where you are with the voice right now, that's where I want it to be. So can we just start over now that you're kind of in the zone? And I was like, sure, that'd be great, man. So we did. And that's how that character came to be. I mean, it was, you know, um, but, but, uh, so he was fun. Um, Kumatetsu from the movie, the boy and the beast, which is, is one of my favorite roles. Uh, same kind of thing. I studied a lot about Momoro Hosada. I watched the movie in Japanese. I listened to the voice actor before I auditioned, um, you know, and got a, got a real sense of what the character was like. And then, uh, Mike McFarlane was the director and he, he kind of guided me along, you know, and, and you know, kind of actually showed me a lot of things that I, I didn't really do, which was, um, you know, have, have a lot more fun with the voice, have, you know, not make it kooky, but give the lines a bounce and a life to it. Not, I'm going to say every line like this, because this is the way I talk. You know, it, it fits okay, but it fits the lip flaps okay, but it didn't have any life to it. It didn't have any style. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that you really have to uh, uh, go after when you're doing the voice. You know, one of the things that I absolutely despise as a director is when I get an actor in uh, and they start to do their, what I call typical standard anime voice. Because everything comes out like this and it all gets real sing song and it just goes up and then it goes down. And I'm just like, that's what are you, you know, what are you doing? That's not, that's not how we talk. So um, I like to, as a, as an actor, I, I certainly like to be able to explore the different uh, uh, realms of what the character is uh, vocally. And mm -hmm. so, but the main thing is, is finding that center of gravity, uh, um, acting wise and the voice will come out and do what you need it to do. So, yeah. Now to put this kind of thing into practice, since you mentioned a since you mentioned, um, stu studying, studying the Jap studying the Japanese, there's, I'd, there, I'd like to bring up one particular character who's, um, Jap whose Japanese voice actor has a very, a very, dis a very distinct voice. That's, um, that's that's unmistakably his. Like you hear you hear it you hear it in a Japanese dub and you know who that is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is um, Oda Nobunaga in Sengoku Basara, who was played by um, Norio Wakamoto in Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you have when you have a voice that's that particular distinction, um, how do you, how do you attempt to carry an equivalent to that? Well, again, you, you're listening to what the Japanese actor did, and you're you're trying to capture that essence. You're not trying to mimic it. You're not mm -hmm. trying to duplicate it. You know, uh, you're but you're trying to capture the same vibe, if you will, the same feel. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, once you do that, I mean, you know, I think your audience will buy in. You know as long as it's not a radically different or a radically big departure from the voice. Um, you know, you can, I think you think you can get away with it. And, uh, you know, the people will, again, they'll, they'll buy into it as long as it, if it's strongly acted, then the, they're not going to pay as much attention to whether that voice is a perfect match or not. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for the, the thing I, I do that all the time, just watching stuff on, you know, animation, you know, you just, after a while, you just, you just forget, you know, that they're doing a voice. It's just like, that's no, that's that person talking. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I, so I don't, I, I just think the main thing is to listen to the, the Japanese actor. They're the ones that created this part in the first place. So, it would be a tremendous dishonor and disservice to them if you didn't do what they're doing, or at least try to sound like them a little bit. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can I can certainly get that. I I brought I I felt it would be I felt it would be an interesting angle to bring up 
um, to bring up that particular character because of how distinct um, Wakamoto's um, voice voice acting style mm-hmm. is, and it's and and like I said before, it's one it's one of those things where um, get we're getting the getting the essence without being without being a um, for lack of a better term a pale imitation is right. something I could see as an as an interesting challenge. Well, and the other thing too is you know there you may be working. Uh, on a character that a Japanese actor did that your vocal range just can't do it. I mean, you don't have the same pipes, you know? I mean, the one thing that I tell voice actors getting into this business is said, listen, man, the one thing you've got to remember is the most important, valuable asset that you have is your voice because nobody has a voice exactly like yours. So that's, that's your biggest asset right there. You got to leverage that, you know? Um, you know, don't try to sound like other characters. Don't go, hey, I can do a great Homer Simpson or I can do a great, you know, Hohenheim. It's like, well, you know what? We've already got people for that. So what you need to do is figure out your own voice. But when it comes to something like, you know, like, again, like dubbing, you need to you need to try to get in there and, and capture what the original guy did mm-hmm. um, without butchering butchering it to the point because you're trying to get it exactly right and you're not you're losing it's in just the overall integrity of the the character itself because mm-hmm. you're too you know too concerned about matching as opposed to the acting portion i yeah i can i can cert- i can certainly see that um with with that with that in with that in mind um i know you mentioned um Vin, the um, dub of Vinland Saga com- um, coming along, but mm-hmm. um, is there anything else that you can tell me that you've get, that you've got coming down the pipe? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, I just finished. Uh, actually, these are already out. But I did a show called Babylon. I uh, did another show called Hero Mask, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, working on a, a show right now that I actually can't talk about, but. Uh, um, it's uh, we've been doing a lot of shows that are actually on uh, Amazon and uh, Netflix, but they're only for streaming. So we're doing the home video version. All so, right, all right. I can I can certainly get. And that. I will say some one of the things I am actually very excited about, if no one's seen it, is the uh, we did four movies of Evangelion. Mm-hmm. We did the three original movies where we there was added animation. We redubbed them, and then we did a fourth brand new movie. So um, definitely check that out on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Now, with with all of that said, um, I would like to give my sincere thanks for for you um, put putting up with putting up with all my all my pestering. What with the massive email chain that we had, not a problem, <laughs> man. Not a problem. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Yeah, I um, I I don't I don't leave get I don't leave Twins games early, and I don't and I don't get and I don't give up I don't give up on the on on any opportunity I can get. So that, that's well, good. The, that's the way that that's the way that kind of thing goes. But anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to discuss future works or or just to just to um talk about the superiority of Texas barbecue. <laughs> or... Well, I will tell you. I will tell you that uh, there are a couple of things that I am very, also very excited about, uh, mm-hmm. and they're they're w- partly anime related and partly not. But mm-hmm. uh, one of them is uh, you know you mentioned Anime Dallas, and um, we uh, we did Anime Dallas. Uh, this is, was our third year last year. Mm-hmm. This will be our fourth year. It's going to be uh, um, I don't know when this show comes out. But the, the show Anime Dallas will be November the 12th through the 14th, 2021 in, uh, at the Hyatt Regency at DFW. And uh, we just, in August, we just had our first Anime Houston. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited because we were expecting about 1,500 people and we got close to 4,500 people. Mm-hmm. So um, it was a huge success. And you know, it was just another testament to me that people are ready to get back and, you know, be with their own tribe and, and hang out together and, and share in the love that, 
they all have for this wonderful thing we call anime. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, the next show will be anime Houston or anime Dallas um, coming up November the 12th through the 14th. And then we'll be turning our focus once again to anime Houston, which will be next year uh, in the summertime, somewhere in the summertime. <laughs> and then I'll be doing a lot of conventions between now and then. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to do two or three a month. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I'll be coming uh, back up to Minnesota very soon. And maybe we can meet together and have a cold beer together. And, um, and I, I can probably, I can probably, um, I can probably extol, ex extol about why, um, why, why anybody who goes to Minnesota owes it to themselves to get, to get, um, to get a hoagie from Devani's at least once. Oh, I've never had a hoagie from Devani's, but we will fix that. Devani's has, Devani's has been a Minnesota tradition since 1970. And okay. it's, it's we what... will fix that. I will get a Devani's. Can you get it in Minneapolis? Yes. You can get it all, you can get it all over the Twin Cities. They're, they're, okay. not, they're not a one location thing. They're a full, they're a full on chain. But they only serve Minnesota the same way um, Whataburger only serves Texas. Right, gotcha. I can appreciate that. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, the other thing that I'm very proud about is I'm working on a book. Well, I've already finished the book. Mm -hmm. It's a children's book called uh, The Jungleberg Children's Reading Community. You can find it at jungleberg.com. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, that's Jungleberg with an H at the end. B U R G H. And uh, we're hopefully going to like to sell, you know, the thousand of books I've got and then create the second book. It's already written, but I've got to raise the capital to, uh, to do it. So um, anyway, but I'm very excited about that. It's been a real labor of love mm -hmm. and um, check that out. But uh, anyway, yeah. So other than that, man, everything is great. And life is good. And mm -hmm. we pulled this off. So, Kudos to you, Mildred, for making <laughs> making it happen. Thank thank you for thank you for coming all the way up to to the temple. And like I said, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, uh, thank you very much. If I hadn't imbibed so much over the weekend at my last convention, I probably would uh, be having a beer right now. But <laughs> I've know. now got a detox. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know the feeling. I know if. I know if you, I know a few good ones if if you're ever in if you're ever in the Minnesota area. I will be, I'm sure, in the next year at least once, maybe twice. So, mm -hmm. you betcha, man. All you right. betcha. Yeah, you betcha. Okay, there's right. there's my talk Minnesota gag for gag for the week. I've filled my quota. But with that said, a sincere thanks as well goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the madness. Thank thank you for being. Very, very patient with me because I know I hyped this up and then it didn't happen mul multiple times, <laughs> to which I apologize. But there will be plenty more madness as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>